Good afternoon. Welcome to Midcap Radar. I'm Sonal Bhutra. With me, as always, is Vivek Iyer. A sharp fall is what we are witnessing from the highs. A big cut. Midcaps they are seeing a bigger cut at the day's low right now, and this has come in in last couple of trading minutes itself. That's right. The selling pressure has accelerated, especially in the last 15 minutes, uh, 15 20 minutes of the session. The Nifty Bank, especially the PSU Banking Pack, is something that's seeing quite a bit of intraday selling. But we have quite a lot lined up on the show. Let's start off with the top headlines. Markets give up intraday gains and extend losses as Sensex falls over 800 points from the day's high, while Nifty declines almost a percent from the day's high. Mid-cap index two turns red, down over 100 points. Banks and autos are the top ranks. Newland Lab surges over 14% in trade after competitor AbbVie fails trials for a drug. The blow to AbbVie is a boost to rival Bristol Mayor Squibb and Newland is expected to be an API supplier for the drug. You know Minda shares surge after the company posted a strong operational performance in its second quarter. The company has posted its highest ever revenue in the quarter gone by. Jubilant Foodworks clocks healthy volume growth with steady margins, but more importantly, average sales of mature source stores hit a high on strong delivery business. The so stock sees a piping hot move. Acom's droughts falls for the second consecutive day and is now down over 19% in two days following a weak Q2. The company's Q2 EBITDA declined 28% on a year on year basis and margin contracted by 290 basis points. All right, so let's talk about the big market fall that we've been witnessing in the last couple of trading minutes. Uh, you know, it's the Nifty 50, uh, the benchmark index, which is seeing a big cut from the highs. It is at the day's low. And if we talk about uh, the mid-cap index, even that is at the day's low. So it's a 270-point cut from the highs on the Nifty. The mid-cap index is down 5 tenths of percent, though it's falling lesser than the benchmarks right now. This big cut is coming in from Nifty Bank, which is down 1.1%. And as Vivek pointed out earlier, is the PSU banking space, which is to blame for that cut. But, you know, we were flattish most of the time right. of the day today. So the idea was maybe we are not falling as much as the Asian markets. This was a respite bulls would have liked after two days of selling that we've been seeing. Uh, but looks like there's more to go. Looks like there's more to go. And now, you know, we'll need to get sense uh, what is the next level that the Nifty actually finds some support at because uh, we've given up that crucial 24,000 level and now, you know, trading near the 23,960 level. So that is one important level that the Nifty has given up. And along with that, you know, have a look at some of the last hour moves. Zydus Life, you know, just came out of this numbers. Uh, sequential decline as far as US uh, sales were concerned. But looking at Zydus Life, you know, at the day's lowest point, down almost 2%. Uh, but we are now joined by Charlene Kumar, the India Small and mid-cap analyst at UBS Securities. He joins us from the sidelines of the UBS conference. Uh, first up, thank you so much for joining us, Charlene. Uh, uh, give us a sense of you know how exactly Q2 has panned out as far as the small and mid-cap space is concerned. Earnings has been quite a bit of a big disappointment. Uh, see, it was a mixed quarter. That's the way I put it, right? So the way I look at the correction, I think it was... Uh, valuations are catching up to the reality. That's the way we look at it. So numbers or the expectation were a little uh, elevated and there's a more of a reality check that's happening over here. Obviously, the val over the past few, few quarters, few years, the valuations have gone up significantly high for many of the mid caps and the performance has been lagging. Uh, this, I, it's easy to say it right now, but this was kind, kind of coming, right? It was kind of coming. Um, but see, you see that there are certain sectors which where uh, stocks have performed and where the numbers have come and market has uh, rewarded them as well, right? So it's not just pure play corrections that what we've seen. There is a divergence, but it's, yeah, what the way I see it is that uh, market is right now not giving any leeway to, uh, you know, any kind of, uh, you know, if you're missing out on performance, etc. right? So the uh, market is going strict in a way. Okay. Uh, you know, Charlene, we are talking about that big fall in the mid-cap index that we saw in October. Despite that, the flows in the mid-cap uh, funds in the month of October came in at record highs. So what are some of the themes that you think are working right now, some of the fund managers who are looking at these themes, and which are some of the sectors from the mid-cap pocket that you would uh, be bullish on? So I can talk about the themes or where we are bullish on and where we could see, where we had seen a lot of resilience. Um, and one of them is a healthcare theme, healthcare services, right? So where, for example, hospitals, diagnostics as a space, uh, there, there, is, there is a clear leg of, uh, you know, uh, tailwinds is there in form of uh, change in patient mix, payer mix, 
right? And we could see that larger, bigger hospitals are doing well. So that's one theme clearly playing out. We still feel that diagnostics continue to do, do well over here, uh, here as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's another theme which we are quite positive on, on that. Uh, uh, second thing which we like here is uh, hotel sector, hospitality. And that's in an upper class and premium class, you know, premiumization story. Uh, that's where it's still playing out. More and more people are opting for holidays and vacations and don't mind spending money. And when we look at the room rates of India versus global room rates, there is a lot of gap there. So we believe that the, you know room rates can continue to increase, and we had seen that in the results. Besides that, some of the themes which we believe, can, which I believe can or will continue to perform, is something like manufacturing, right? So. Uh, China plus one theme is is still relevant, um, and that, that that will continue to play out. There were some good numbers in, in that theme, right? Uh, obviously, a lot depend on a bit of a macro, but that is very very much resilient. So, manufacturing in the auto banks or manufacturing in other segments is very much resilient. So, that's where we are positive. Charlene, uh, you know, when you're talking about uh, outsourcing theme, uh, especially the auto ancillary theme, uh, when you're talking about the U.S. and the Euro market, you know, both of them are seeing a bit of a degrowth as far as, you know, the auto OEMs themselves are concerned. So in that context, you know, where do you see growth coming in and how do you see Indian players, Indian auto ancillaries actually benefit in this difficult environment? So see, uh, the, the way to play it is that uh, there is a pressure over there uh, on those things. But when you look at certain certain amount of the auto angst or rather the part of the auto segment is like the forging part, for, for instance, right? The industry itself globally is pretty fragmented, right? So uh, and more the more and more pressure comes to them, they will resort to outsourcing. Yes, I agree on that, that if global, uh, global auto demand will be under pressure, then there may be some pressure that, that is likely to come on Indian manufacturer. But at the end of the day, outsourcing to India is a solution for global auto uh, auto players, uh, auto as well as industrial players. So that theme may have a short term pain, but but over a medium to long term, it, it is pretty resilient. You know, Charlene, you're also bullish on exchanges as a theme. Do you think that part of the rally is largely done because even valuations are high here. If you're talking about valuations uh, in the mid cap space, is there anything specific that you like? And you know, wealth managers they are also some, some they are also gaining from the big equity run that we are seeing. Um, is that a space that you like as well? See, exchanges again very interestingly, while they have rallied, uh, uh, but valuations are not much different from like year two years back. That's the that those exchanges the performance of those exchanges is largely driven by earnings earnings upgrade and all. Right, so at least on the valuation side, I'll say there is not so much of discomfort. Now, uh, exchanges are a play of efficiency, and any economy which is growing and you know uh, where the uh, where the economy is uh, going in a digital form, etc., and where the efficiency is building in, exchanges play a very very big role. If we compare exchanges, Indian exchanges, whether it's commodity, energy, right, uh, we see them are minuscule compared to global exchanges, right? So at the end of the day, if you compare by any metrics, like as a percentage of GDP or as a percentage of the business sizes, commodity market size, energy market size, etc., there is a lot of headroom for them to grow, right? And as I said, uh, specifically in those spaces, we haven't really seen a, a very big uptick in, in valuation. There is some bit, definitely, right? So, but not not like uh, other sector, right? So, it's largely earning driven. Understood, that, Shalin. So, you like uh, you know select healthcare diagnostic players. You like select outsourcing players. Uh, exchanges, you know, you do see some operating leverage kicking in. Uh, which are some sectors, especially post Q2, that you will strictly be avoiding, and uh, maybe you know some of the sectors that investors can stay away from? What is your view there? Uh, uh, see again. There is no sector I'll say strictly avoid. It's it's like on on watch, and I'll be mindful about on, on the thesis, right? For instance, a chemical sector, right? So uh, we have seen a, a meaningful amount of disappointment in the chemical space, right? And that's largely because uh, that the whole thesis of specialty versus commodity kind of of uh, falling apart, and um, you know we are facing challenge from the Chinese manufacturers who are gaining market share in that segment. That's our thesis. So I, uh, you know. There, the China plus one strategy. I will be mindful about just just going uh, going by uh, what what has happened in history. So unless we 
we see demand really picking up in the global environment, or we see you know, you know, you know maybe new administration in the U.S. doing something, something uh, uh, you know against our competition in China. I'll be very very mindful about picking that space. The second space where we haven't seen really any uptake or kind of disappointed is in our you know home improvement segment. So that's remain a challenging uh, space as well, and uh, you know, I'll say I'll be in, in no rush to enter into that segment because again, uh, while there are earning cuts, but valuations are still there what they were, and uh, okay. even the management confidence or the oh, okay. uh, you know underground checks are not guaranteeing any meaningful jump. All right. Okay, thank you so much, Arin, for joining in today with that take on the sectors you're bullish on and the ones that you think should, investors should stay away for the time being. Let's slip into a short break now. On the other side, we'll be in conversation with Hindalco's management on their quarter two performance. Stay tuned for that. Okay, the fall is getting uh, deeper actually. It's 222 points lower on the Nifty right now. We are very close to being below the 23,900 mark as well. And it's led by what we are seeing in the banking space. And other than that, if we look at some of the stocks which have fallen this hour itself, Trent is one of them. We have Britannia, which is seeing further cuts, Asian pain. So some of these consumption names are looking at uh, some pressure which has come by as well. Uh, in terms of uh, the big fall, it's HL again, which is at the day's low. We have Bajaj Auto, ITC, some of these names which are putting pressure on the Nifty as well. And ICICI Bank as well is under pressure. But we have to talk about the other Nifty company, Hindalco. Quarter to aluminium EBITDA came in above estimates, while it's copper EBITDA beat expectations. My colleague Nigel D'Souza caught up with Satish Pai, the managing director of the company, and began by asking him about aluminium pricing and alumina as well. Listen in. First, I have to remind you that the average aluminium price for the second quarter was $2,358. So not very far from what I had predicted. So I think that, you know, uh, currently it is running between $2,500 and $2,600 because there is uh, a sense of uh, optimism regarding the China stimulus and its effects, the fact that the U.S. economy is doing very well. And also because I keep repeating the supply and demand of aluminium continues to be quite tight. So which is why uh, the aluminium prices are being uh, supported at this higher range. One other important point is also the fact that alumina prices are at all time high, six to $700 a ton. And that also has a positive impact on the prices of aluminium. Got it. Focusing on alumina, uh, what proportion of your total production of al alumina do you sell in the open market, if you could give us a rough number? So uh, we sell 700,000 tons of alumina. Our total production is about 3.7 million tons of alumina. And on the third party market, we sell about 700,000 tons a year. Got it. Let's focus on the copper business. You have been guiding that the copper EBITDA per quarter should hover in the range of around 600 crores odd. But in this quarter, it was the highest that we have ever seen. Was there an element of some derivative gains out there? Could you explain it to us? What was that What was that number? And what is the quarterly run rate we should work with from here on? So I think that this quarter was very good for uh, multiple reasons. Uh, one of the things was copper demand was good. Our operations were very stable. We got very good premiums on the copper rod and downstream products of copper that we sold. Gold sales was at an all-time high. Sulfuric acid prices were also pretty strong. And as you mentioned, we also had a one-time derivative. So I think that uh, I would continue to say that our uh, guidance on the quarterly is six, uh, still around 600 to 650 crores. You continue every quarter to have a little bit of noise from an accounting point of view. All right. What was the uh, quantum of the derivative gain in the past quarter? I think that I would rather leave it that, you know, uh, we believe that Every quarter, we would be around 600 to 650. Hmm, interesting. All right. What about Novelis? The street is a little bit disappointed that you withdrew that guidance. Earlier, we were factoring around $525 per ton. Tell us, for the second half of the year, the worst-case scenario, what will Novelis' EBITDA per ton look like? 
And for FY26, since we'll be having, uh, you know, some capacities that will come on stream, and you have indicated that things will improve from year on. So what is the rough number we work with for Novelis's EBITDA per ton? So the first thing we have to note is that Novelis had quite a good second quarter. Compared to all its competitors, it did pretty well. If you normalize for that CR flooding event, their EBITDA per ton was 502. Their absolute EBITDA was 487. So Novelis, uh, compared to its competitor and overall, had a good second quarter. Now, looking ahead, why did we pause the guidance on the EBITDA per ton is because of scrap spreads. China has now removed restrictions on any scrap coming into the country. And hence, there has been a huge buying of scrap by Chinese uh, players from our markets like Mexico, US, and Europe, which is why the scrap spreads have tightened. So which is why we are saying that for the next couple of quarters, we'll have to see till this situation stabilizes. And hence, we are on a wait and watch as far as EBITDA per ton guidance goes. You know, worst case scenario, what will the EBITDA per ton look like? And for FY26, hopefully this uh, concern on spreads will cool off. So where is the EBITDA per ton headed? So I think that, you know, the EBITDA per ton is impacted negatively by scrap spreads. But I also have to remind you that market conditions are also slowly improving. So as we sell more volumes, we will get, you know, we are today selling about 950 KT per quarter. We are expecting it next year to get closer to our million. So I think that, you know, on an EBITDA per ton, we'll still be in that $500 per ton uh, ballpark range. Okay, got it. So fair to assume, though, with the current uncertainty for the time being, the novelist's IPO is put on the back burner and we shouldn't hear about it, say, in the next six to around 12 months? I wouldn't go as far as 12 months. Okay, so six months is what we can assume. What about the CAPEX number? Uh, could you tell us how much have you all spent and how much are you looking to spend in the second half of the year? So the, the more important thing is now that, you know, we announced uh, during our... Uh, uh, earnings results and our calls, if you see, that Hindalco India is going to go on a growth on the upstream side. If you remember now, for the last three, four years, we have been investing heavily in both aluminum and copper downstream. Now, the next phase of growth in the next three years is going to be in the upstream. So we are committing to spend roughly four to five billion dollars over the next three years. And that's going to be, you know, we have announced an alumina refinery in Odisha and a copper recycling plant in The Hage. And now we are announcing a smelter expansion brownfield in Odisha and a copper smelter expansion in The Hage, so a billion dollars each. So really the big story over the next three years is going to be a big capex spend to increase both aluminum and copper upstream capacity. Got it. So what should the debt number look like then? So over the next three years, uh, right now, the India net debt to EBITDA is negative because, you know, balance sheet is clean. We have 12,000 crores of uh, treasury. So over the next three years, when we go through this CapEx cycle, so mostly funded through own cash accruals, and our calculation is that we will probably borrow about a billion to billion and a half over the next three years. So, you know, net debt to EBITDA will still remain well below one or one and a half. But we will be borrowing about a billion, billion and a half to fund this uh, capex growth that I just outlined. All right. The Adani Group has also suddenly sent some sound waves that they want to be rather aggressive in the metal space. What do you have to say about that? Enough for everyone? Or will a new player, you know, forcing their way into the metals market put some pressure? I think that I would say that we are very, uh, very optimistic about the India growth that's happening we are very optimistic to see the aluminium and copper demand that is growing in the country. In fact, both of them are growing at double digits year on year right now. And we also believe that uh, our most of our expansions, if you note, are brownfield, which means that the execution risk is much lower. So we are very comfortable that we will be able to execute our strategy in India. Okay. And any interest in Hindustan copper? Uh, you know, we have been chatting about it, Mr. Pai. When the stock was 250 rupees, it went dancing away to 400 rupees. It's back around 270 rupees. Have you heard something for the government with regard to their intent? I, I think, uh, you know, as we say, if it comes, we are always in, uh, interested and will take a look. But probably you need to start to ask the question to the government and Hindustan copper rather than me now. 
Well, some very important commentary coming in from Hindalco. The stock has cooled off from the day's highest point. But let's now slip into a short break. We'll get you more on the markets and stock-specific action on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Midcap Radar. Well, uh, you know, the markets are not looking pretty. It's looking quite uh, weak at this point of time. The Midcap Index now down almost half a percent. The Nifty, again, still continues to trend below the 24,000 mark. But this is our special segment, Midcap Movers. Hormuz is standing by the wall to take us to the Midcaps that are moving around in the session. Hormuz, it would have been tough to find some stocks in the green. <laughs> well, it was. if it was the broader markets yesterday, it's the benchmark indices today that are struggling for momentum on the upside. And the broader markets, too, are starting to feel some of that pink as we speak, the mid-cap index off the highs of the day now. But some of the losers in the broader markets, most of them... <clears throat> belong to the consumption space. Sterling and Wilson, Marico, Voltas and Piramal Pharma, a recent outperformer is now down to the lowest point of the day, 5.5% lower on that stock. Some of the other earnings reactions that are coming in as we close down on this season's results. Sriveni Turbine at one point was up 13%, but that too is succumbing to some pressure from the broader market sell-off. The Jubilant Foodworks, Uno Minda's results came in earlier today and Ramco Cements, a profit compared to expectations of a loss, that too seeing a positive earnings reaction. Uh, PSU banks are some of the laggards in today's session. The Bank of India, Bank of Baroda, Central Bank, all of them are down to the lowest point of the day, 1.5 to 3% worth of losses. Stocks that are doing well on the back of volumes in today's session. Some of them that are bucking the trend, some of them not so. MMTC, UPL is also down to the lows of the day, but still 3.5% higher. And Acom's Drugs now down 20% in two sessions on very strong volumes, 10% lower today as well. And lastly, some stocks that are in the green, or you would hope that they are still holding on to the greens. Yes, they are. Macrotech is up 4.5%. G Vernova remains locked in a 5% circuit. And Mastech and LNT Tech too having a good day at the office compared to some of the others. Clear outperformers in a day where you're seeing quite a bit of a sell-off. Thank you so much, Hormas, for taking us through the entire list of uh, mid-cap buzzers. But with that, you know, it's all the time we have on this edition of Mid-Cap Radar, Mutual Fund Corner, when we return. <laughs>